Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and I am so happy to be back with you for another episode of the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I got back from London last week, as you may remember from the last episode. It was so much fun. Oh my gosh. We had, first of all, it was great seeing our friends and hanging out with them. Um, we spent the first day just hanging out at their at their house, um, and they live in a suburb of London, so we got to see their neighborhood and, uh, you know, like normal neighborhoods, normal areas, not like the touristy areas. I don't mean normal in a pejorative way or anything, but just, you know, where people actually live. And and so we got to see that and see their house, and it was just wonderful. And then on Saturday, we... Saturday or Sunday, no, Saturday we went to Piccadilly Circus, we went to a jazz club called Ronnie Scott's, and then Sunday we did one of those hop on, hop off tours. We didn't actually hop off anywhere, we just did the whole tour just so we could get an overview, like all the touristy spots, all of the historic sites that they take you to on the on the bus, and um, then next time we go we'll have a better idea of what we want to explore more, but oh my gosh, it was just It was so amazing. It was so fun seeing our friends and um, the Commonwealth Games were on while we were there. So my husband and uh, one of our friends watched a bunch of the Commonwealth Games and I learned a bunch of new things that I didn't necessarily know about British sports and various things. We watched some British game shows. I don't know. I'm just, I'm such a dork. I am, I was, I, I was geeking out the whole time, not only from the history, but also just watching the BBC, <laughs> having, having, um, having television in English was fun because, you know, you don't get a lot of English television into Portugal. Understandably, that is not a diss. I, you know, you should, you should have Portuguese television in Portuguese, right? But, uh, very much fun. But then I woke up Tuesday morning, which is the day we left, and I had um, I was feeling very asthmatic, very chesty, and yeah, turned into bronchitis. So I've been sick since we got home. And that's why I sound like this. And I sound like this in the interview as well. Um, I had at one point thought maybe I would re-record my parts of the interview, but that's hard to do when you're having actual conversation and dialogue. I mean, it's not like I, sometimes there are just questions that I could take and re-record, but then other times we're having an actual conversation. And so I didn't want to didn't want to ruin what was there by trying to re-record and I don't sound that great anyway so it's not like I would be making that huge of a difference I apologize this isn't the first time I've recorded sounding like this but I I still apologize I always do apologize (laughs) at any rate the book the author yay I am speaking this uh this week to returning author Lydia Kang we are talking about her historical fiction novel the half right half life excuse me of Ruby Fielding this is another book in uh, a series of books that she's done that they're all standalone novels but you can they have connected characters the there's um family relationships between the characters in the books so you can read them in order or you can read them out of order but then um, also know that there are are some references to some of the people mentioned in some of the other books Uh, that's those are the the connections between the books Um, but again standalone that you can read either in whatever order you want or in chronological order okay so this one as i said is called the half-life of ruby fielding uh brooklyn 1942 War rages overseas, and brother and sister Will and Maggie Scripps continue to contribute to the war effort stateside. Ambitious Will secretly scouts for the Manhattan Project, while grief-stricken Maggie works at the Navy Yard, writing letters to her dead mother between shifts. But the siblings' quiet lives change when they discover a beautiful woman hiding under their back stairs. This stranger harbors an obsession with poisons, 
an aff- affection for fine things, and a singular taste for killing small creatures. As she draws Will and Maggie deeper into her mysterious past, they both begin to suspect she's quite dangerous, all while falling helplessly under her spell. With whispers of spies in dark corners and the world's first atomic bomb in the works, the visitor's sudden presence in Maggie's and Will's lives raises questions about who she is and what she wants. Is this mysterious woman someone they can trust, or a threat to everything they hold dear? So, that is the description of The Half-Life of Ruby Fielding. Uh, Again, it is by Lydia Kang. It is, as you heard, historical fiction. takes place during World War II, but uh, World War II stateside, so that's a little bit different than some of the World War II historical fiction we've talked about. Um, I mean... That's the crazy thing about World War II was that it was a world war. So I, there's so many different locations that you can have World War II novels set. And we have talked about quite a number of them uh, in various times on this podcast with different interviews and such. And I just think it's fascinating all of the different possibilities there are for World War II historical fiction. World War One to a certain extent as well, but um, World War II is definitely captured people's attention right now in terms of historical fiction. Um, So this is World War II historical fiction, but it is also uh, a mystery. It's suspense. You aren't quite sure what to make of anyone's motives throughout the story. Everyone, of course, has their secret and not-so-secret motives. Everyone has their light and dark sides. You're trying to sort through what everybody's... um, Are they lying? Are they not lying? Are they hiding things on purpose what is going on with all these characters so it's definitely a page turner and if you are a fan of historical fiction then you should definitely check it out but i'm going to let lydia talk more about the book uh, so you can hear more about the book and the other books that are in this same um series for lack of a better word and she can tell you more about all of that so again the book is the half-life of ruby fielding and the author is lydia kang Hi, Lydia. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, it's so good to be back. I, I actually, I was going to say welcome back to the podcast and did not. So um, I'm happy to have you back. I'm <laughs> to talk to you again. Um, we are going to talk about your newest historical fiction, The Half-Life of Ruby Fielding. Before we get to the book, though, if um, you could refresh the listeners' memories a little bit and tell them uh, a little bit about yourself. Sure. So um, I am a physician and an author. Um, I write historical fiction, including The Half-Life of Ruby Fielding. Um, My last one was Opium and Absinthe. I also write young adult fiction as well as nonfiction. So my last nonfiction book, which is co-written with Nate Peterson, is Patient Zero, The Curious History of the World's Worst Diseases. And before that, we wrote um, Quackery, which many people have heard of, um, A Brief History of the Worst Ways to Cure Everything. Um, I live in Omaha, Nebraska. I um, am still seeing patients here, and I live here with my family and my two dogs, which hopefully will stay quiet during this uh, interview. I also have two dogs, and they are currently in their bed being very grumpy with me because I made them go to their bed. (laughs) I had to close all the shades to keep them from barking, so fingers crossed. (laughs) Oh, yeah, well, I I agree. (laughs) So this is the, if I'm, if I'm counting correctly, the fourth book in, um, it's not exactly a series, but they're all kind of interconnected in certain ways in terms of the family members. Um, Can you give an overview of this particular story? Sure. So the half-life of Ruby Fielding takes place during World War II, and it is in the New York City area. So Manhattan and Brooklyn, a little bit of Staten Island as well, which is a little bit unusual because I feel like most people who are sort of digging into World War II novels tend to find those books taking place outside of the United States. But I was really fascinated with um, what was going on at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and the Manhattan Project. So, you know, the creation of the atom bomb. So the story centers around a brother and sister duo, uh, Maggie Scripps and Will Scripps. Will is secretly working for the Manhattan Project. Maggie has just gotten a job at the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yard. And they, um, Will comes home to discover this strange, mysterious woman passed out under the stairs um, of his house. And they take her in thinking they're just going to, you know, revive her and then send her on her way. But she sort of insinuates herself into their lives and they, they both fall for her and they can't quite figure out 
everybody starts lying <laughs> for various reasons and nobody can sort of figure out what everybody else is, is doing and is somebody a spy and what's going on. So that is uh, what the story is about. Yeah, nobody, nobody can tell the truth in this book. I mean, they tell truth, but you can never quite tell who is telling what truth. Um, question that just occurred to me that I can leave in or take out, but I am curious. Um, why do Will and Maggie have the same last name when, I mean, I, I can't picture Will's stepfather actually adopting him. Is that mentioned in the book? Did I miss that? No, yeah. So he, um, so Will and Maggie do have different fathers. Um, their mother, um, was married and her, uh, Will's dad died in um, World War I. So uh, they were alone for a while. And, you know, um, their mom is the kind of person who can't seem to function without a man in her life. And so she relatively quickly got remarried and Maggie was born. Um, and so, yeah, so Will took on the, the last name of his stepfather, um, but they, they never really get along. And, um, at some point in time, we find out that um, Maggie's mother um, dies by suicide. And, you know, Maggie's a young teenager and Will is in college at Columbia at the time, but his sister is just really unable to take care of herself because she just sort of falls to pieces very easily. And so he quits school to go back home to take care of his sister. And when we meet them again, um, they are, Will is um, taking night classes at Brooklyn College and, um, Maggie's trying to get a job, but she's still a really fragile person. So they have a bit of a complicated uh, backstory. Okay, so now that you have a bit more of an understanding about the book itself, it's time to take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the different points of view from which the book is told and written. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with author Lydia Kang about her historical fiction novel, The Half-Life of Ruby Fielding. Let's go ahead and return to that interview. The book is told from main, Will and Maggie's perspective for the most part, but with Ruby's perspective as well. Did you um, at any point want to try to write it from just one perspective or did you always want to tell it from those three different sides of that triangle? You know, it's funny when I write, when I set out writing books, I usually don't have in my head, like, I'm definitely going to do this from like two points of view or three points of view. Cause I have written books that are two POV, three POV, um, but not always. So like a beautiful poison is, has three main characters and the, the chapters switch around from the different perspectives of these three characters. And so when I started writing um, Ruby, it just happened. Like I, I opened up like my, my document and I was like, you know, I had a blank page and immediately I was like, okay, first chapter is going to be Will's perspective. It's funny. Like a lot of my writing, I plot everything out, but there are still surprises, like many surprises along the way. And usually some of the biggest twists happen as I'm writing. Like I don't have them all figured out ahead of time. So that was, a, that just sort of presented itself. It, it was like originally all going to be um, Will and Maggie's perspective back and forth. And then once we, I turned the manuscript in to my editor, um, they were pretty adamant, like, you know what, since Ruby's name is on the cover, we should probably have her perspective once in a while. And it actually worked great. So she pops in like three times in the book, you see her perspective and it's, it's got it. It was done in such a way that you, even though you hear her voice and you are in her mind, you still don't know what the heck is going on with her. You're like, I don't understand. Are you a good guy? Are you a bad guy? Like, well, are you lying? Are you not lying? So 
um, it was really fun having to go back. I'd written the whole uh, manuscript and then I had to go back and drop in some perspectives directly from Ruby so that every once in a while the reader could get her perspective and yet still not know what's going on. So that was pretty fun. And that's one thing that I like about your books is that you get um, real people. Yeah, obviously they're fiction, but you know, they, they aren't just black or white. They've got all of these different layers because not everybody is just one thing. I just, I appreciate that um, the characters are so complex because humans are neither good nor bad all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is what makes for a more interesting story because I think that even if you have a character that's wholly evil, they're really two dimensional and it gets a little boring after a while because you always know they're going to be evil. And if somebody's wholly good all the time, it also makes the story a little bit, uh, it's predictable, right? So, and there is nobody who is so purely perfect. So it never really works out, I think, for a character to be so two dimensional. You have to make them a little bit more complicated. Um, in this case, it was really easy, but they all had very different reasons for why they acted um, in a complex way, which was um, fun to write. And kind of tied into that, it, for people who have read your prior books, the, um, Ruby is the daughter of characters in A Beautiful Poison. And those characters, if I'm remembering correctly, were not, were, were complicated as well. So she is the daughter of complicated characters. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, that's, and that's, you were asking before about how I had written four books and it is true that they are all tied together. Um, so the character of Ruby Fielding is the daughter of, um, Aline Fielding. And, um, she is a character that is in a beautiful poison. And so I had a lot of fun because I, these historical novels all take place in Manhattan and they're all, they all tend to have like a science-y medical kind of bent to them. And I thought it would be really fun if the, um, the lineage of these characters um, were all interconnected. So you do not, they're all standalone books. You do not need to read prior books to read any one of them. Um, but I think it's kind of, they're fun Easter eggs for people who want to read more than one book to see that there are connections between all the books because there is a bloodline that runs through um, the whole series. And you mentioned that you're more of a plotter, so you, you have a good idea of things in your head. Do you have the, your version of a family tree for the lineages in this book? These books? You know what, I do. And I was actually thinking about putting the family tree into the Half-Life of Ruby Fielding, but I, I kind of decided not to because it was a little complex. But um, yeah, so they're just sort of there for Easter eggs. At some point in time, I should actually write one out for people if they were interested, um, because it gets a little, it does get a little complicated, but, um, but basically they are all related to um, the character of Cora Lee, who shows up in um, The Impossible Girl, which takes place in 1850. And Cora Lee is um, half Chinese and she is a grave robber. <laughs> so they all have this sort of like, ooh, like this sort of whispery, like, oh my God, there's this person in our family who's like a little bit unsavory, but, um, but they're there. So it's kind of fun to have that sort of background. Yeah. And that's one of those Easter eggs. So, you know, you're reading it as though it's a standalone novel and then a character will say, yeah, I think one of my ancestors was a grave robber. And it's just kind of a throwaway comment, but it's not. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, in, in terms of character, um, so Will and Maggie are, are your two main perspectives with Ruby thrown in there, but what, what is, about the, these three characters and mainly Will and, and Maggie, do you think it will resonate with readers? Um, I think each of them have something that is, that everybody will resonate with. So, you know, um, Will is a, a guy who is, um, he's a really big muscular kind of athletic looking guy. He's the kind of guy who like, if you were walking down the street and he passed you and you were a woman, you'd sort of be a little like, Ugh, like I'm a little scared of this guy. And I really want to play on people's first um, kind of impressions because Will is so tired of being the guy that like people look at and they think, he's a meathead, he's dangerous, he's not very smart. And actually he's highly intelligent. I mean, he's working for the Manhattan Project and he's trying to figure out how to like work his way up the ranks. He is studying um, nuclear physics at night. 
and I love that juxtaposition of um, being like, you know, somebody on the inside and somebody on the outside, which I think most people have had to deal with at some point in time in their life and just being judged by how you look. Right. And uh, for Maggie, it's, um, you know, she's just uh, somebody who is very, very afraid. She's always afraid of like, am I going to fail or can I really do this? And I think she basically lives in imposter syndrome, right? So, and I think it's a really common feeling. I, I, no matter how amazing you are at what you do and um, how much of an expert you are at something, um, oftentimes there is uh, this element of you know, do I actually deserve to get the credit for what I'm doing? You know, do I actually know what I'm talking about? Or how do I know that people aren't going to just shoot me down and be like, you don't know what you're doing, you know? So that imposter syndrome, I think is a very pervasive feeling that we all go through, especially when we're younger, especially when we are in our early twenties, which Maggie is um, just trying to figure out how to be an adult and not really knowing if you're succeeding or not, or not really knowing if people are going to call you out and say, you're, you don't know what you're, you're doing. So I think those two characteristics that Will and Maggie have been going through are are pretty, um, you know, people are really going to get that. People are going to really feel like and understand what that feels like. When when you sit down to write a new, well, in this case, historic fiction, um, do you tend to have the story in mind first or the characters in mind first or a combination thereof? You know, it's in the beginning, it's a little bit abstract. So when I thought of the half-life of Ruby Fielding, there was one part of me that was like, oh, I really want to write a story that takes place in World War II. So that was one huge element of it. The other one was um, the fact that I knew that on the Columbia campus, um, part of the Manhattan Project took place in the physics building. So I went to Columbia as an undergraduate. And I remember hearing about how you know, there was a cyclotron in Pupin Hall and part of the Manhattan Project happened there. And so I was always fascinated by like, I, I I, like lived on a campus where like this piece of history happened. And I remember thinking like, I really would love to include that. Um, I had also been fascinated by how the Brooklyn Navy Yard was the city of manufacturing that really just blossomed during World War II and how women were brought into the workforce. And, you know, it's just, it's such a um, iconic, you know, uh, thing, people knowing about how, you know, women were like Rosie the Riveter, that sort of a thing. And I really wanted to tap into that history. So I had all these different things going on and I tend to write thrillers slash murder mysteries. Um, And so all I really needed was, well, how am I going to actually create a story out of this? Um, And I, I also wanted the idea of somebody built like, you know, growing a poison garden. Uh, I find poison gardens to be fascinating. I have yet to visit the poison garden in, in England. Um, but the idea that someone would purposely plant things that kill people has been something that I've been toying with for a long time. I actually wrote a short story, but it's a fantasy short story um, about something like that. So I was like, you know, they're all over the place. And I'm like, how am I going to bring this together? How, how? And I, it took a lot of work for me to finally put together uh, a story that could embrace all these different aspects and come together. So it was a, a bit harder to put this one together than I think all my other previous books, because um, I had to work with the timeline of what was happening in World War II, um, specifically in 1942, when women were uh, they really opened the gates for women to come in and work in the Brooklyn Navy Yard with the bombing. When did the bombing of Pearl Harbor happen? Like what was happening stateside during the 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 month or two where the book happens. And so it was a lot of work to really um, pin down all the the details of the plot. But I'm glad it I'm glad it worked out. It finally did work out. Are there elements, anything um, that you really were fascinated with or loved that just didn't work for the book? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think I wanted to have more um, detail about Maggie's work in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, but the way that the story went, I kept having to pull her out of the actual Navy Yard to do some sleuthing and figuring some stuff out. And so I kept having to pull her out of her job. So she kept getting in trouble because she wasn't showing up. So I think that's the one thing that I sort of wish could have worked out, but it just, it never would have for this particular book. But um, to have her really develop her skills in the Navy Yard and actually start welding, you know, um, 
in more of a formal capacity. Like I would have loved to actually see that process, but it didn't, you, you get to see some of her, you basically get to see her in training, but you never get to see her outside of the training period. And so that's, that's one regret I sort of have, but that, that can't kind of be fixed. So um, yeah, that's probably one of the big ones. And, and that's something that I kept getting so frustrated with Maggie or maybe with you. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like you're doing well, stop skipping out on work. <laughs> but see, that, that's a really fun thing, right? It's like, you kind of want to frustrate your reader a little bit because that tension is exactly what drives the book forward. Cause you're sort of like, you're screwing things up. Like if I were you, I would do it this way. But of course you have no control over the characters as a reader and they're off doing something that you're like, this is a terrible idea. <laughs> and I, I, I like to do that. Like it's, it's fun to frustrate the reader because that builds tension and you can't help but wonder like, all right, you're, you're about to get in trouble for this, but you have to sort of turn the page to figure out like, how is that trouble going to happen? Right. So. <laughs> Ugh, authors are so mean. <laughs> they're mean to their readers, they're mean to their characters. You're just terrible people. <laughs> uh, that's what we do. And that's, yeah. <laughs> On that note of me accusing all authors of being terrible people, uh, mean, mean, terrible people, we are going to take our second break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking more about the other books that are in, that have come before this book and their connections to this book. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. the GSMC Book Review Podcast. As you know, I'm speaking with author Ruby, not Ruby Fielding. I'm speaking with author Lydia Kang about her novel, The Half-Life of Ruby Fielding. So let's go ahead and return to that interview with Lydia about Ruby. All of the books in this, uh, I, I keep calling it a series, but it's not really, you know what I mean. Um, in this, um, in these books have a, sort of the medical aspect, some of the the poisoning aspects, those kinds of things that you're, you're obviously interested in, but um, what different kinds of research did you have to do for this particular story? I would imagine a lot into the Manhattan Project, into nuclear fission, all, the, all those one, fun, all those, excuse me, fun things. Yes, 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 yes. So we do have, there was a lot of research that I did. Um, with all the research that I do for my historical fiction, there's usually several different phases. So um, one of the major things that I do is I try to get a really detailed map of all the areas that I work in because I can't write unless I can physically orient myself in the space. So since all of these take place in Manhattan, I'm usually printing out these like gigantic, like they're like table size, like sometimes they're like 10, 12 feet long by three feet wide. Um, detailed maps of the area. Then sometimes the maps that I can find actually have building numbers and building names on them. So I can really see like what was there at the time. So that's one of the things. The other thing I do is I try to get as many books as I can on the era. So I read um, a book on decades that shows sort of like what's happening um, news-wise, fashion-wise, culture-wise um, at that time. You know, World War II, it's easy to get a lot of that information because it's in, you know, the 20th century. Um, doing this stuff from like 1850 was so hard because you can't just find easy online archives of like 
people giving like oral histories, <laughs> like that, those things like don't exist. Right. So it's a lot harder to do it. The farther in the past you go, the, um, the more difficult the research is, but on the other hand, you, the, the readers also trust you more because that, since that, that information, there's very little access to it. They, they really trust you in what you you've read with world war II. Um, I know that there are a lot of readers who are like, no, no, that you got that detail wrong, or you got this wrong, because everybody reads about World War II, and and you know there are, uh, you know that generation of people who lived in that era are unfortunately dying, um, and so now it's becoming more of uh, the really the readers who are um, just very attuned to that era. So um, yeah, I read a lot of books about um, what it was like to live in Manhattan at the time, or live in Brooklyn, what it was like to live in a shipyard, what it was what it was like to be a female shipyard worker. Um, and then, uh, I read other books that were, um, novels that took place during the time, but whose, um, research I really respected. So, um, uh, Jennifer Egan wrote a book called Manhattan beach, uh, where one of the main characters, uh, works in the Brooklyn Navy yard. So I sort of read that voraciously because she did like a huge amount of research for that. And that sort of, you know, I don't use that as a backbone of my research, but I use it sort of to, double check that I'm what I'm looking up sort of makes sense or what I'm going to put in the book sort of um, jives with uh, other things. So there's a lot of different layers to the research and it, it takes a while to do. And um, it really slows down your writing because every other sentence, you're sort of like fact checking yourself, that sort of a thing. Um, but it's a, it's a really fun, fun process. You said it takes a while. And, and just when you said that, I was thinking, how long does this take? So when you're writing a historical fiction novel, and I know it's not going to be the same for every book, but approximately how long does it take you from, you know, getting the idea, starting your research, doing your outlines or whatever, until let's just say you submit your first draft. Right. Uh, I would say probably nine months, um, which is still fairly fast, I think, for some writers. I think there's some people who would write a historical novel and it takes them like a couple of years to put a draft out. Um, maybe even longer. Uh, I usually try to do my research for several months. And then at some point in time, I say, you know, you need to kind of stop because you're starting to look up things that aren't actually salient to the book, but you're, you, you, you keep sort of like um, going down that wormhole, like something, one thing leads to another thing leads to another thing. And the next thing you know, you're sort of like, you know, this is going into a depth of detail that the reader never needs to know about. And you're, you're going too far. So I usually can tell when that's happening because I start to get antsy about actually writing the manuscript. Um, but I'm, I procrastinate by doing more research. So <laughs> um, I know when it's time to write, when I imagine scenes in the book and I can see them. So if in my head, I can see them, like I can place myself on the street. I can see what the storefronts look like. I can look down and see what my character is wearing. I know how much it costs to take a trolley. I, um, I know what the language is going to sound like when they start talking. So as soon as I can place myself and feel really oriented, I know it's time to start writing. And that usually takes um, several months of research before I get there. Okay, thank you. Before we started recording, um, you had mentioned that you had just submitted a, another manuscript. Can you say anything about that work? Or do you, you know, either way is great. If you want to talk about it, we can or not. Uh, I can tell you just a little bit about it because, um, so I am currently writing um, or have finished writing a novel for uh, the Star Wars franchise. So um, this is with Del Rey Books, which is um, a Penguin Random House imprint that does um, Star Wars books. So I wrote an adult novel called Cataclysm. And uh, it is actually the sequel to another book called Convergence, which is written by Zoraida Cordova. And um, it, it takes place in phase two of the High Republic, which is about 300 years before um, the Phantom Menace. And that's all I will say about it. <laughs> uh, which is fine, but my brain just went in six million different directions of how many people <laughs> have to know about that universe in order to write a, a novel within it. Oh my gosh, the, just because that fandom is rabid. Then it is. It is. And it's funny because I've been noticing, I mean, I'm like, a, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, obviously. And I have been since I was seven years old, which is when I saw Star Wars in the movie theater. But, um, 
but it's really funny because every time I like I'm watching TV or I'm listening to the radio or whatever, like, like about three times a day, someone makes a reference to star Wars. And I'm always like, Oh my God, (laughs) that is so unreal. Um, Because it's so integral to people's um, cultural experience and it's pretty cool that I, I get to be a part of that. So it's, it's pretty thrilling. I got to say. That's, that's very cool. And as somebody who has watched them her entire life, you know, it's, it's always kind of fun and funny for me when I talk to younger generations who maybe started with the prequels or um, it's just for me, you know, you got to start with a new hope and work your way chronologically. Oh, I do. I agree. I think you have to go with four five, six. And then go one, two, three, <laughs> and then and then do um, seven, eight, nine. I think that's sort of how. No, no, you have to re- you have to watch Rogue One after you have to do four, five, six, one, two, three, Rogue One, and then seven, eight, nine. So yeah, it's and then figure out where to put the Clone Wars <laughs> and Star Wars Rebels. And- oh my gosh, yeah. Well, you gotta figure out how to fit that. I mean, I guess maybe watch yeah. them all at the same time. I don't know. <laughs> right, exactly. Someday when I have scads of free time, I just want to go do everything in chronological order it'll take me months. oh i know it, i know it'll probably take you a year but it's uh, uh so much good stuff <laughs> but, back, but back to you and your books um do you have an idea uh, you mentioned in the afterward of this book the half-life of ruby fielding um something that you're thinking about potentially for the next novel can you talk a little bit about that you know what? Not yet, because I still don't know what I'm going to write next. I have so many different ideas right now, um, and they're really very different. Like, I have another historical novel that I'm thinking about doing, but I also have, like, a contemporary um, sort of suspense I want to do. I also have another one that's, like, a you know, like, a dark comedy that's, like, a paranormal dark comedy that's contemporary. Like, I just have so many ideas. I don't know what I'm going to do. I probably need to sit down with my agent and be like, here are my ideas. And what do you think I should do next? Because I can't decide. Um, There is a part of me, to be honest, that sort of wants to take a break from historical novels because it's so much work. And there is, um, there's a certain cadence to writing historical novels that's um, slower. And because you can't, you can't just write it you're constantly getting stopped by having to fact check yourself. Um, And it's with every sentence because it's with, you know, what they're doing, what they're saying, like they're going to turn a doorknob and you're like, did they have doorknobs back then? I mean, it's, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's very challenging. And so there's a part of me that's sort of like, I've done four (laughs) back-to-back historical novels and I kind of want to take a break from that. So I might take a break, but I will probably eventually come back because I do have a great, idea for another one that I I very, very much want to do, but I think it takes place in France for a change. So um, I don't know. We, we will see, we, we shall see. And and you're, you know, you're progressing to the 20th century. So eventually you're going to catch up if you keep, if you you keep going too fast. I know, I know. And I do have, um, I did drop a couple of seeds at the end of the book that could conceivably turn into a next novel that takes place either right after um, Ruby ends or within the next couple of years. So there are, it, I, I dropped, I dropped that in there so that if I wanted to continue, I could, so I sort of left that door open. Um, but I am not sure exactly if I'm going to do it or not. So we shall see. It's like the literary equivalent of sourdough starter. Oh my- <laughs> it is. And you can just keep it in the fridge forever. Just feed it once in a while. It's like, for me, it's like mentally just sort of revisit the idea. Do I still want to do this? Do I not hmm, I think about it? And then I, I kind of stick it, feed it, stick it back in the fridge, decide later. Um, I think it's funny that you bring that up because we actually have sourdough starter in our fridge. So <laughs> uh, that, from what I know of you, which is obviously not much, but you, you're very, you're very sciencey and, and <laughs> science. Yep. That sounds terrible. Um, not at all. <laughs> I always like when Lydia comes on because there is a lot of um, laughter in addition to some very fun conversations. So I really appreciate that. But it is time for our last break of the podcast. When we return, Lydia will be talking about some of the books that she has been reading um, or is about to read. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, 
being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Lydia King. You obviously read a ton for research um, purposes, but for instance, you are about to go on vacation. What are you taking with you to read on vacation? Oh, that's a really interesting question. I am listening to a book on Audible right now. I'm listening to Big Little Lies. So um, I know that everybody's like been watching it and people are saying that it's fantastic. So I'm sort of right in the middle of Big Little Lies on Audible. Um, And then uh, I got a really good recommendation um, to read the follow-up to The Martian. Um, It's not a sequel or anything, but it is uh, written by uh, the, the um, uh, the same author. And um, apparently um, it's really, really good. Uh, so I'm kind of looking forward to, to reading it. It's called uh, Project Hail Mary. And um, I'm probably going to read that when I'm on vacation because I, it's been a while since I've done some science fiction. And, I'm, and Andy Weir has a tendency to make his books extremely science-y. Like they, he totally geeks out on the math and the science. And I can I totally go for that. And I really enjoyed reading The Martian. So that's probably going to be my next book. Okay. You were talking about Big Little Lies. And I thought, uh, this is terrible. I can never remember what I've read, which is why I write every book down. But I had to go in. I can't either. Like you guys sort of caught me off guard because I'm like, I knew this was a question that like I might get asked. And I'm always sort of like, I know it's, it's, uh, I'll be able to come up with it. But I'm, I tend to be really bad at like on the spot coming up with names and titles of books. So people would be like, what's your favorite book? And I'm like, um, <laughs> <laughs> I need a couple moments here. <laughs> yeah. So I, I went to, I went to Audible to look it up and see, does this book look familiar? I have did because I would have listened to it. And it's got this, the, the, from the series, the pictures of the actors from the series. And I'm like, no, I need the actual <laughs> book cover. Come on people. Oh, I know that kind of ruins it for me, you know, because yeah. I don't, oh, I, it, it's, I have always noticed that when I read a book, I see the characters in my, in my brain a certain way. And if I watch a movie, I'm always like, okay, I get that. That's what your characters look like, but I don't see them that way in the book. So for example, like way back when with the Harry Potter books, when I read the books, they all look a certain way in my head. And when I watch the movie, I'm like, oh, you know, there's Daniel Radcliffe, et cetera, et cetera. But as soon as I I would open the book again, the movie versions would just disappear and I would see the book version. So I, I've always done that. I don't know if other people do that in their brains, but that's how mine works. No, I, I, I agree. And sometimes when I watch things that I've read, I think, yeah, that's really good casting. And other times I think, did you even look at the book? <laughs> I know exactly. Uh, but then it, I think it goes to show you how well, um, you know, sometimes you're reading these books and the authors do such a good job of crafting that character that you can't help but know exactly what their face looks like or exactly how they walk and that sort of thing. And it's one of the reasons why I rarely have book covers that have characters' faces on them. I think I have a single book cover that has a face on it, and that is The November Girl. Um, That being said, she's sort of a little bit at a distance, so it's not like somebody's face is like all blown up. But I've always been pretty adamant about, like in The Half-Life of Ruby Fielding, there is a woman on the cover, but you can't see her face. She's turned away. And I love that because... That is that in and of itself is like a metaphor for someone sort of hiding, right? You can't see her face. You don't know what she's thinking. You don't know what she's looking at. Um, she's holding a letter in her hand. You don't know who the, who the letter is for. If she wrote it, if she just received it, that sort of a thing. And so I, I really do love it when the book covers don't have faces on it because I want to be able to create them in my own mind the way the author had in mind. So right. that, but that's just me. I don't know. <laughs> no, I totally get it. Um, in terms of internet presence, I know you have a website, so if you can share a website and any social media that you're active on in case people would like to get in contact or, you know, interact with you on social media. 
Sure. Uh, my website is lydiakang.com. Pretty straightforward. Um, it usually has my events list on there. And if you have questions, you can totally, um, you know, send me messages that way. Um, probably of all the different social media, I'm the most active on Instagram. And so I'm at Lydia Kang on Instagram. I tend to post things about like my dogs and things that I'm cooking or eating and my books. So it's a big mishmash of my life and writing and stuff like that and being a doctor. So it's sort of all over the place. So um, yeah, come find me on, on Instagram or on my website. Uh, I um, love interacting with my readers. So wonderful. Well, Lydia, we have, uh, we've talked about a variety of different things, um, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you would want to mention or bring up at this point? Not that I can think of, except to say, you know, um, thank you guys for, for chiming in. I love um, talking to you and you guys have such a wonderful program. And so, you know, give a like and follow here as well, if you can. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I appreciate you taking the time, especially since I know I caught you between a deadline and going on vacation. So thank you for fitting me in. Um, it's greatly appreciated. You are so welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again to Lydia for joining me to talk about not only the Half-Life of Ruby Fielding, but the other books that are connected with it and uh, other books that she's written and letting me geek out a little bit about Star Wars and oh, so many other things that I geeked out that I don't even probably remember now. Uh, it was uh, It's always fun to have her on the podcast and this time was no exception, so I hope you enjoyed our conversation. If you are a fan of historical fiction, um, in this case, World War II historical fiction, but that takes place here in the United States, then you should definitely check this out. But if you're a fan of historical fiction in general and um, suspense with um, some medical stuff thrown in, with some science stuff thrown in, with really interesting female characters, with interesting uh, family relationships and dynamics, then you should check out all of these books by Lydia, all of her historical fiction books. There are several, four, I think this is the fourth, um, but regardless, uh, you should check these books out. They're, uh, they're well-written. They, they each take place in a different, interesting uh, historical time period, and like I said, really great characters. Um, you're not always sure of their motivations or whether or not you uh, like them or not, or, you know, maybe not like, but you're not always convinced. Are they good? Are they bad? Eh, they're a combination thereof, like most people. So definitely check out Lydia's books if you are interested. And of course, then she also has the nonfiction and the young adult. So um, lots of options for you if you're looking for something new to read or a new author to read. Uh, I hope that you will join me for my next interview. It's um, another returning author and another historical fiction. This time we are going back in time about 20 years to the 1920s um, in Ecuador and the author is Lorena Hughes. The book is called The Spanish Daughter so I hope you will join me for that conversation in the meantime. If you are a fan of this podcast, like, follow, subscribe, um, leave a review, do all of those things that are so very helpful to get this podcast out to more listeners such as yourselves. It's very much appreciated. Thank you in advance if you uh, should be so moved to do any of those things. Also follow on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Love hearing from listeners. Let me know what you're up to, what you're reading, etc. Hope you're having a great day. Hope your week is off to a really good start. And um, whatever your plans are for this week, I hope it already has had lots of this time, but that you have plenty more time to get yourself lost in a good book or several good books if you so choose. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.